What's going on, y'all? And welcome back to another episode. I'm Swiper Cam, and welcome to my channel. Y'all, we hit 4,000 subscribers two days ago, and we already have over 4,500 subscribers in just two days. In just two days, we've added over 500 subscribers, so let's see if we can get to 5,000 quickly. Y'all, this channel, it ain't even been a full four months yet, and we almost at 5,000 subscribers. Hit the subscribe button, y'all. Ain't nothing like the Swiper Gang. So, I just got done watching the Denver Nuggets playing against the Portland Trailblazers on April 21st, 2021, and the Denver Nuggets squeaked squeaked their fourth win in a row without Jamal Murray against the Portland Trailblazers, 106 to 105. And that game was a little too close for comfort. A little too close for comfort. Ah, man, I went into the game. I'm like, all right, Austin Rivers made his debut today. Monte Morris is out. Faku's going to have to guard Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum. Let's see how it works. Let's see what happens. But the thing was, I figured we would get the win because Portland doesn't play well against teams in the top 10 in offense and the top 10 in defense. I don't even know if they've been beating a team in either of those categories in the top 10 all season, and they've been floundering. They just lost to the Clippers by one point last night, and again, they come back again, and they lose to the Denver Nuggets. And, man, it was a decent game, man. Jokic, Jokic tonight, 36 minutes. He had 25 points, 9 rebounds, and 5 assists. He was down across the board. He was only 9 of 18, down across the board, 1 of 6, 6 of 7 from the free throw line with one block, and he was a plus 3 in the game. The Denver Nuggets won by one. Will Barton tonight, 14 points, 6 rebounds, and 4 assists, 5 of 13 from the field, 2 of 8 from the 3-point three, three line, 2 of 3 from the free throw line, 1 steal. He was a plus 4 in the game. The Denver Nuggets won by one. Michael Porter Jr. had 31 minutes tonight, 17 points, 5 rebounds, 2 assists, 8 of 12 from the field, 1 of 4 from the 3-point line. He was a plus 2. But here's the thing. Michael Porter Jr. tonight had 17 points in the first quarter. He was 8 of 8 in the first quarter. He got froze out in the second quarter. And again, I don't know if it was intentional, but once that second unit came in, and then once he came back in the game, he just didn't get a chance to touch the ball. And the Nuggets went up with the lead. At the half, they went up 60-57, to 57, so they were scoring, but MPJ just get, didn't get the ball back. So, man, it was a very interesting game watching that. MPJ didn't hit another bucket the rest of the game. He only took four shots the rest of the game, and he missed all of them. Some of them were four shots. He started off the third quarter with a heave, a heave shot that he didn't need to shoot. Body was contorted. It, I don't think it's fair, and I said this on Twitter, I don't think it's fair to ask Michael Porter Jr. to – basically take off an entire an entire quarter and then come back and just light it back up again. I joked I said that ESPN is going to have Michael Porter Jr. on the on the on the MVP watch list come tomorrow because he's going to go off for uh, 30, 40, 50 points tonight. But again, he just didn't even get a chance to touch the ball. So I think as Michael Porter Jr. gets older, as he continues to grow as a player, as he continues to develop as a player, I think that he's going to continue to be able to get to the point where he's averaging about 25, 27 points per game on crazy efficiency. Again, 8 to 12 tonight. So he was really good. He basically was 8. He was 7 of 7 from the field tonight, and then he was 1 of 4 from the 3, or 8 of 8 from the field, 1 of 4 from 3, or 7 of 8 from – so he just he just played really well. Uh, but then he just got flashed out the rest of the game. So I don't like it. It's just not great. It doesn't look great. You can tell that – Sometimes he gets a little antsy because he's still young, because he's been, you know, froze out for a while. But anyway, man, Aaron Gordon tonight, decent game, 12 points, 6 rebounds, 3 assists, 4 of 11 from the field, 2 of 4 from the 3-point line. You need that. 2 of 2 from the free throw line. You need that. Plus 2 of the game that they won by 2. And he had 2 steals. Faku Composite tonight played a good game in parts. He was just a little short out there at times, but he had 12 points, 5 rebounds, 3 assists, 4 of 6 from the field, but 4 of 5 from the 3-point line. Killer. One block, and he was a plus eight, team high plus eight. Uh, so if you can tell by the by the caption, I wanted to just go ahead and get through the game. I wanted to go ahead and get through the game. As you can tell by the thumbnail, there's a very particular subject that I said I was going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the Nuggets got to win. This is their seven and one, I think, without Jamal Murray in this stretch. 
Uh, and I think they're like 11 and two with Aaron Gordon or something like that. I think Adam Morris from DNVR put that. I think they're 11 and two. So man, they're they're creeping, they're climbing, they're playing well, and they're doing what they need to do. They're getting wins, and then they play against the Golden State Warriors come Friday. So they're 38 and 20. So anyway, Nikola Jokic. So there has been this common question of. Nikola Jokic, is his ethnicity, is him being Slav, is him being a Serbian, is that why ESPN, Fox Sports, why so many people were having so many issues with Jokic, with his game, with accepting him as the MVP, accepting him as a, an elite player, an MVP player, somebody who is a Hall of Famer, somebody who's the most outstanding player in the NBA, is it because he's Slav or Serbian? And I talked about this briefly but it's really important and so uh i'm only answering this because you all have been asking me about it and you've been making comments about it and i want to you know be provide some education for those who just may not know so again y'all uh, america and the way that america has understood sport is primarily looked at sport as an opportunity to allow or for black people to be able to excel using their physiology so again we talked about this before but America has long prioritized black physicality and even violence among African Americans. So, you know, you take it all the way back to the slave days where you have uh, the Mandingos that are wrestling for the slave owners and you take it all the way up and through what happened with the integration of sports and you start to get the Jesse Owens of the world, the Jack Johnsons and boxing of the world. And then you start to get up into where you have the NBA and the NFL, or these predominantly over 70% black sports. So one of the things that people have to understand about the way that America has dealt and not dealt with the issue of race is for in many ways, black athletes especially have always felt, many of us have always felt that our only way to make it in this capitalistic society and a society that has bent seemingly towards white people and against black people is through sport. So sport has primarily been the way by which many African Americans, many black people have been able to express themselves, whether it be spiritually, emotionally, and obviously physically. And one of the things about Jokic is that Jokic, again, he's, it's not only that he's from Serbia, that he's foreign, that he doesn't speak English as a first language, uh, but really a lot of it has to do with his play style. He's finesse. Like I talked about, like we talked about, and again, everybody's going to be, whenever, whoever says this from now on, it's coined on this channel. Jokic is water. Bruce Lee. Jokic knows how to bend. He knows how to curve. He knows how to move, to find the crevices, to find the gaps. He knows how to take advantage of just the smallest incision, and he can kill you for it on the basketball court. That's how he plays. He always takes advantage of what's in front of him, whether that be aggressive and get 45 or 47, 12, and 5, 45, and 5, or whether that means he's going to get 16 points, 22 rebounds, and 13 assists against the Clippers in the game seven. He just finds a way. He finds a way to get the W. But the thing is, that's great basketball. And if you're a pure basketball lover, if you're an international basketball lover, if you're an American who has really learned how to prioritize sport and the game and the flow of the game, again, somebody like LeBron James, as physical as he is, his IQ is outrageous. And he loves basketball. He studies basketball. He can appreciate somebody like Jokic. The Reggie Miller, the folks that have made up the game, they can appreciate Jokic because they know what it takes to play the game. If you ask NBA players who have come and gone about Jokic, they love him. Because he's doing things that only really they can see or people that are experienced watching basketball or coaching basketball. But to the average American viewer, they're not going to be able to look at Jokic and what he is. Look at Jokic's play style and value it for what it is. Because to them, it's inferior in, in theory, inferior in ways and physicality. It's inferior in expression to what you see from LeBron James, Michael Jordan, even your Sean Kemp's of the world, your Dominique Wilkins of the world. Just this just brute athleticism. But here's the thing, and then some of the comments were made in response to this. Well, yeah, well, obviously that's a bias. That's a that's racist towards white people or white athletes. And so one thing that needs to be cleared up is racism is a it's an ideology that was put in place. Uh, again, you can read about it. Uh, uh, Friedrich Blumenbach in, in, in German history, uh, the five races, the racial categories. Uh, the system of racism is built to substantiate white existence as superior to all others. So it's impossible for black 
athletes or there to be a a racism towards white people in America because that's just not the way that the ideology works. And on top of that, one of the other things that was mentioned to me was, well, how can it be? It's obviously because you know there's a more majority black audience, so they prefer watching black players. I'm like, no, it's a majority white audience. African Americans only make up 13 percent of the U.S. population. We are the poorest demographically in the United States because of systemic racism. We have been the poorest since 1619 when transatlantic slave movement started and then up till now. So we don't have the ability to be the major fan base. We make up a fan base, but we don't make up a major majority. It's, it's usually Anglos or white people who do. So they have learned, though, from centuries of watching black athletes, they have learned to prioritize a certain kind of style. And again, it's even the way that the human mind is conditioned. You know, when you get Bleacher Report or you turn on Twitter, you want to see 10 seconds of Duncan, bow, bow, bow. You want to see Giannis Antetokounmpo. You want to see Joel Embiid. You want to see Michael Jordan. You want to see LeBron James, Zion Williamson. Y'all, think about it. The Pelicans had, going into this season, even though the Denver Nuggets made the Western Conference Finals, the Pelicans, the New Orleans Pelicans, who have not made the playoffs and did not make the playoffs and will not make the playoffs this year, they have more nationally televised games than the Denver Nuggets did, even if they have Jamal Murray, Michael Porter Jr., Nikola Jokic, the MVP. Even though they made the Western Conference Finals, even though they had two Game 7 series comebacks, Zion Williamson had more because ESPN, in the way that they, they, they solicit their program, they prioritize that kind of athleticism. So they prioritize that from a marketing standpoint more than they would somebody like Jokic, who is a pure basketball player. Again, I would even go to this. Uh, Matt Moore and I think Adam Mars been asking this question. I think Ryan Blackburn and Matt Moore as well. But one of the things they discussed on the podcast was, you know, if Larry Bird was around now, would he be celebrated like he was in the 80s, in the late, in the early 90s? Like, would he be celebrated that way now? And again, it's a good question. But it's in the thing, the thing about Larry that people don't remember, Larry's from Indiana. Larry's from, like, backwoods, Indiana. And Larry would talk. He was just a tough dude. He talked to anybody. He would step up to anybody. He punched Dr. J in the face at one point. Like, Larry Bird didn't back down. So Larry had a different kind of tenacity to him. He was just very aggressive. That kind of, of tenacity, that kind of veracity, that kind of, of quote-unquote toughness, that fed into him being accepted not only by the media but really by black players at large because black players have – this. When you the NBA is a is a predominantly again seventy percent black sport, so is the NFL. So when you step into that arena, in order to get respect, you really have to prove yourself. Now a lot of y'all might not have seen the movie, but there's a movie that came out with Woody Harrelson and uh, Wesley Snipes in the '90s called White Men Can't Jump, and the whole concept was like there was this white boy that stepped on the basketball court, nobody thought he could play, but then all of a sudden he could play, and Wesley Snipes and Woody Harrelson started hustling everybody, and so they started they came up to two on two tournaments and all this other stuff. But the thing is. The reason that movie even existed is because there is a notion that there is a when you see a, a white person in America that is just balling, getting off, not just getting off, but hooping against brothers and, and killing them. It's always a shock, but it's like a pleasant surprise because most people that are dominating in the sport are black. It's, and again, it's a black sport by and large. But the thing is, remember the sort of comment, by the way, Montrez Harrell last year in the playoff when he called Luca. I'm not going to say the phrase, you know, we have kids watching and all that, but B-word, a white boy. He called him a B-word, a white boy. So when that comment was made, again, some people are looking at it like, well, that's racist. You know, why would he, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like if, 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 if Lucas said that to Montrez, then that would be racist. So why is this different? It's like, well, y'all, first off, there is no historical concept to calling someone a B-word, a white boy. Like that's just, that's a phrase. Whereas if you say, B word, a black boy in America or in a colonial world, that's a no, no, because that's a historical degradation. White people have used language like boy or the N word to subjugate black people via language. So that you, that's just not, it's not in the same category. It's just not, it doesn't exist. There's no historical power to calling someone a B a white boy. But the thing was in some cases, when you got Luca and you got Jokic who are, who are Slav, they're not Anglo, they're Slav. Thank y'all for helping me with that too. When you got people that are don't make up that the, the majority of the skin tone in a American sport where it's predominantly black and a, a certain kind of toughness is usually needed to be successful, then you got Doncic and then you got Jokic coming in. And then, yeah, you're going to get responses like that from black athletes because, again, it's, it's a shock. But 
it's just the play style. It seems feminine to media and it's not true. It's not feminine. So don't hear me say it's not feminine at all. It's just, it doesn't seem as masculine in ways. So that's why that kind of language is utilized, even though it's not true. It's not fair. Luka Doncic was just busting a tail and he got upset. But that's the thing with Jokic. When the media, when ESPN, Fox Sports, when they watch Jokic, it's like, yeah, he's busting tail. Like, oh man, this is crazy. So Nick Wright, uh, they put up this, this, uh, they had like these five players on the list. It was like, they had all uh, the the top PERs in the NBA, and Jokic was leading it in number one, in the 31.5. And then you had Joel Embiid, and then I want to say you had Zion Williamson, then I want to say you had Giannis Antetokounmpo and Steph Curry. So they're talking about it, and people are saying, well, obviously he's leading the PER, he needs to win the MVP. We're talking about Jokic. Nick Wright makes a comment because uh, somebody said, well, you know, you can stop Steph. You just got to trap him and double team him. You can't stop anybody else on this list. And Nick Wright said, honestly, if we're being honest, the player you might be able to stop on that list is Jokic, most likely. Out of So out of Zion, out of Joel, Giannis, and Steph, he said the player you could stop is Jokic. And I'm sitting here like, who, when, where, what year, what team, what player, what zone, man-to-man scheme, double team, stop what? Stop 26? Stop 8.8 assists? Who's going to stop it? Name them. No, Giannis didn't stop him. AD didn't stop him. He was shooting over 50% against AD in the playoffs. Dwight Howard can't stop him. Who has stopped Yoke? Who has stopped him? When, when Dwight Howard was giving Jokic issues, it was because he was fouling or just being uber aggressive. Because that was his job. When Jokic struggles, it's because people are just being overtly physical with him. Not because he's soft. His brothers are the same size as him and they're both his older brothers. He's been wrestling his whole life. So it ain't because he's soft. It's because he is allowed to to be physical against like refs allow people to be overtly physical with him because he is so finesse because he's water because he just moves and adjusts. So when the referees ref him, they obviously just ref him differently. Like there's all these charts you can go and look up, but like Jokic is he's, he's, he's attacking the paint at at an extremely high rate, but among all the players attacking the paint, he by far has the lowest shooting free throw rate of all of them by far. And not even free throw rate, but lowest foul rate in shooting motion by far. Even even Doncic is up there in the 70th, 80th percentile, but that's because he's a he's a wing player. He comes into the lane. He he just he just he draws fouls in a different way. Whereas Jokic isn't really trying to draw fouls. He's trying to get the ball up, but he's getting hacked while getting the ball up. Whereas Joel Embiid is hunting fouls, and he's just a very dominant physical specimen. So you almost have to foul him to keep him just getting two points easy. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into it, y'all, but. If you're not from America or if you're not educated on this, it's not because, just because Jokic is white, that the media has some angst against him seemingly. But it's a mix of him being white, him playing finesse and being water, but also because the way that America has learned how to value basketball is through dominant athletes. You think about three best players in NBA history. Michael Jordan, crazy athlete. LeBron James, crazy athlete. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, crazy athlete at seven feet tall. So you just look at who makes up the top 10 on best players in the NBA ever. Magic, all these players, Shaq, Tim Duncan. It's just the way that they were viewed. Even Tim Duncan, that's the thing. Tim Duncan and Jokic are basically the same in media, like reluctantly giving him the MVP because he is just dominant. But that's the thing. Jokic is way more entertaining to watch than Tim Duncan. I like Tim Duncan too, so don't get me wrong. But Jokic does things way flashier. He's and again, his clutch situation is is he's doing Sambor shuffles like he's up and under in. He's slow Euro to dunks. Like he's just he's amazing. But again, it's just the way that we have historically understood what is valuable in NBA basketball. So I I know this ain't clearing everything up, but I wanted to at least give you an opportunity to hear another perspective as to why. So you can see that it's not racism, but it's it's an, it's a bias for black physicality that's not from a, a, a fully healthy place it's from a healthy place in the sense that yeah when you have a majority black sport you expect a certain kind of athleticism but it's not from a healthy place because again a lot of that viewpoint of how especially a large majority white audience views Jokic and the disdain they have for him comes from an unhealthy place of what they have valued from black people since we have been in this country since we were enslaved here. So a lot of that is tied in together. So I, I hope this at least puts something into perspective. Um, 
if, if you're a media member listening to this, I hope that this is somewhat valuable to you. Um, and I'm trying to help you add another perspective to it. Again, as somebody who's a former D1 athlete who has studied this um, stuff for a long time. But anyway, all I know is this. The Nuggets got another win. Jokic is on this MVP tear. Jokic gets a revenge game against the, the Steph Curry-led the Golden State Warriors on Friday. And the Denver Nuggets are 38-20. and 20, And they are almost 20 games over 500. And you start this how we started this season off? Man, who would have thought? So anyway, I appreciate y'all swiping gang. Follow me on Twitter at Swipe a Cam. And I will see y'all soon.